Thank you so much, uh, Cristiano. It's really a pleasure to um, be here with everybody today. And I, I would like to say thank you, especially to Cristiano for the invitation um, to participate in this series. Um, the faculty and community seminar on interpreting studies and practice um, has a number of really interesting um, presentations that have been given thus far, not only this year, but in the past. And so I was um, excited to be able to um, participate um, as a speaker in this um, presentation. Um, as he, as Cristiano mentioned, um, my presentation is going to focus on the intersection of technology and language access, specifically here in the US and in the US courts. Um, and I'm not going to focus on one particular study um, or one that is currently ongoing, but rather kind of take a 30,000 foot view of what technology is, how it can function, and how it can enable or potentially hinder language access, and um, look at some of the trends and developments of the technology that are out there and see how those can be used in order to support um, language access efforts in the US courts. Um, my presentation is going to focus, I would say, largely on spoken language interpreting. However, um, uh, sign language interpreting um, has a number of intersections with a lot of what I'm talking about. And so the, the examples hopefully will be relevant to both signed and spoken language interpreting. Um, and um, I think that they go kind of part and parcel. They, they go together and they're important to be able to consider as a whole. Um, before I get started, I think it's kind of important that you know a little bit about where I'm coming from. Um, I'm based here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, so it's a little warmer than some of the places that I've been seeing snow the past couple of days. Um, so we're fortunate um, in that respect. Um, but previously I was in Ohio um, and that's where I did my uh, state court certification um, in Spanish and English. So I do work as an interpreter. Um, Spanish and English are the languages that I work with, um, but I also work as a researcher and as a professor. So I have one foot in the profession and I have one foot in the academic world. And so I'm gonna try to bring those two together as we talk about technology and language access. Um, so to kind of paint with some broad strokes, um, my goal is to talk about language and how it's used in the US courts um, and to think about what technology actually is, how it's being used, um, is it a help or is it a hindrance? What types of tools are being used and how are these being configured? Um, what are our digital realities? What are, what are we currently seeing? Um, particularly in light of the pandemic, I think I would, it would be remiss to not at least comment briefly on the current situation and how technology has filled a role that I don't think any of us had really anticipated, at least to the extent that it has been uh, in, the, in the past year or so, um, and, and how that kind of dovetails with some of the emerging trends that we see. So what do we mean by language in the courts? Um, there is no official language policy in the United States that states and stipulates that English is the official language of the country. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't unofficial language policies that kind of are in place, either simply by nature of the fact that that's the language that's being used or that it's a tacit understanding. And so in this instance, English is sort of the de facto language, um, the de facto official language in the courts. Um, and it's in light of the fact that um, it's the language that the record is kept in. It's the language that business is conducted in, that uh, decisions are issued. And so English is kind of the starting point that we have um, in, the, in the court system. And so really when we, when we start thinking about languages in the plural, um, people who either do not know English or have a limited proficiency in English are ultimately faced with a situation where they need to work with or through an interpreter in order to be able to engage and work with um, the US court system. Um, that's a bit daunting if you think about it. I know for me, I, if I had to try to navigate a court system in another language, that that would be a daunting task. Um, and 
even knowing the language, I think the, the intricacies and the specificities of our own language can be um, something that we're most familiar with. And so finding a way to do that and, and making provisions to ensure that everybody can access these services and do so in an equitable manner becomes important to think about. Um, the need to interact with the US court system is, um, is also kind of important to be thinking about. Um, I think a lot of us um, probably have been watching a lot of Netflix and Hulu over the past um, six months or so. And so crime dramas and, and things like that might be what come most readily to mind when we think about in, in the court system and, and criminal matters. Um, and of course, that is, is definitely part of this discussion. Um, but there are other times in which a speaker of a language other than English may come into contact with the US courts. It may be in, um, in civil matters. It may be to get a restraining order. It may be to seek settlement in some sort of civil matter um, as a witness, um, as a family member. So there's a lot of different um, reasons that people come into contact with the legal system. And so it's important to keep these kind of in mind when we start thinking about language access and the ability to, to engage um, with the system. So what languages are out there? Um, we have English, um, but in the National Court Interpreter Database, this is just a rough estimate. There's over 180 different languages that are listed with 120 that are regularly used. Um, how we define regular is, a, is another matter, but the fact that there are as many languages listed as there are um, is suggestive that we have a, a very multilingual diverse um, population that is going to potentially be in contact with the legal system. And so um, the question kind of becomes, how do we go about doing that? And who are the people that are going to be helping to um, uh, mediate in this sort of linguistic and cultural space. And I, I hope at least in this group that we would all agree that it takes more to interpret than simply knowing both languages. Um, and over time, there have been efforts to kind of standardize these skills. So in the past, um, we, we may have seen family members, we may have seen um, uh, neighbors, well-intentioned bilinguals, court staff, we might have seen a lot of different people trying to provide um, these interpreting services, but those, um, those people perhaps don't have the, the background that they would really need in order to be effective. And so some of those first steps to try to standardize and, and, and establish a certain guideline uh, we see in the late 70s and 1978 there's the signing of the court interpreters act um, and that was kind of a key milestone um, at the federal level to provide um, interpreters um, and and kind of led the way for certification and the ability to be able to demonstrate have people demonstrate that they have the requisite skill set to be able to interpret in court um, I'm not going to provide a full historical account of, of the development of U.S. court interpreting, but I think it's important to, to keep that one in mind. Um, and there's a huge need. Um, so not only do we have um, a lot of that uh, uh, interpreting happening, but we, but we have many, many documented cases of needing interpreters. So for instance, um, there was a study that was completed in 2015 in California with um, that demonstrated that there were over a million service days of interpreting that were recorded over a five year period. And so the, the, there was a, a great deal of interpreting that was going on then, it continues now. And if we try to expand that out past the borders of California, um, those numbers continue to be rather staggering. So making sure that there is interpret, there are interpreters available and how do we do that? And can we use technology to try to leverage um, what is in place to be able to make that um, possible becomes in increasingly important. As a general reminder, um, these are all the people that are involved. Um, I think this is what a lot of people think of when they, when they think of the court system, the judge, some attorneys, defendants and witnesses, maybe a jury, uh, maybe, a, uh, maybe a bailiff, 
maybe family members, police officers. But when there's somebody who is an LEP um, who is, um, I'm going to go ahead and clear all of the drawings that people are putting onto the um, screen here. Um, when we when we start thinking about um, when there's an LEP or a non-English speaking person involved, we need to keep in mind that there is also going to be an interpreter. Um, and so that interpreter is going to be providing language access not only for the um, non-English speaker or the lim limited English proficient person, but also for everybody involved. And in order for that individual to be linguistically present, um, they need to be able to interact with all the various parties and those parties need to be able to interact with that person. So the interpreter is, is serving in multiple capacities here um, to be able to, uh, to facilitate that kind of communication. So interpret, interpreters are great, but what does it really mean to have language access and how do we determine what language access looks like? Um, what are the concrete ob objective measures, if you will, that we can point to that, that show what language access actually is? Um, and that's a kind of a difficult concept to define and to, to demarcate those borders of what is language access. Um, you know, one of the questions becomes, well, we should just make sure everything is available in all the languages. And so it's kind of this everything goes, we need everything all the time. Well, that's, a, I think, an idealistic view. But if we consider there are 180 languages that are in that database, that might become either cost prohibitive or resource prohibitive. Um, and so that I can, I can think of at least a few people that might push back on that, um, on that effort. In contrast, we might, we might say, well, let's do this on demand. So anything that somebody wants or needs, we'll do it in real time on, on the fly. Um, and that may in fact be possible. Um, but again, this may ultimately challenge um, the ability to provide services in a timely manner if we have to wait for a professional translation um, to be done. So perhaps a combination. Um, might be an approach. And so there's a lot of different language access plans that various courts have tried to put together to discuss and talk about what it means for them to be providing language access and language services in their courts. Um, language even becomes a challenge here to define what does it mean about language access. Are we talking about the L1 or the native language of somebody, the language of habitual use or preference? Um, if we have a, a, a party, for instance, who is a Quiche speaker, but also speaks Spanish, do we provide interpreting services in Quiche, between Quiche and English, or between Spanish and English? Um, and these are questions that have to be sorted out um, in these language access plans. And I think a lot of people already have a pretty strong idea of what that might look like. But initially, um, these are the questions that were kind of in play and, and determining what is is going to be the best uh, uh, course of action. Um, the, these language access plans have been kind of um, shaped by guidance that comes from the Department of Justice. Um, there are, um, if we go back here and we look at this, this timeline a little bit, um, we have that Court Interpreters Act in 78 but also then there are some additional milestones that kind of come up related to language access in the courts. We see the Supreme Court of New Jersey puts together a task force in the early 80s. Um, we see an executive order that's, that's issued um, at the federal level and some uh, Department of Justice guidelines that come out. And I think it's, uh, you know, we often think of interpreting um, as the major way of, of providing language access in the courts. Um, but written translation is also specified in some of those guidelines, and I think it becomes important for us to think about um, what, uh, how written translation may intersect with interpreting as well. Um, so these, these language access plans, as I mentioned, we, they have interpreting services. Um, for a long time, it was predominantly in criminal cases. Um, immigration and asylum have, are other areas, and, and may not fall under the same set of guidelines. And so 
um, given the structure of the legal system in the US, um, those guidelines uh, are applicable in some, but not all cases. Uh, so uh, we also see um, in some of these instances, we see bilingual staff uh, being included in the conversation, um, not to provide interpreting services necessarily, but to provide access points um, in languages that are used quite often in specific districts or specific um, court systems. So these language access plans can be quite handy um, to help provide guidelines. Um, as I mentioned, certification becomes a really important um, component here. And so we have the National um, Consortium for State Courts um, has a state level certification that's available in quite a number of languages. Um, and so people can be certified in a number of those. Um, at the federal level, there's also um, certification available in Spanish at this point. There used to be um, Navajo and Haitian Creole, but those have since been retired exams. And the National Association of Judiciary Interpreters and Translators at one time had a certification exam as well. And so these certification programs really helped establish that minimum threshold um, of what it takes to work in the courts. And they, they look at those three modes of interpreting that everybody kind of points to, the simultaneous interpreting, the consecutive interpreting and site translation, um, but written and technological components are largely absent. Um, the the Najat exam, I think had a written component at one point in time, um, but that exam has since been retired. Um, but there's no real technology component built into it. And so while the exams are providing a minimum threshold and a foundation on which people need to be able to function in a court setting as an interpreter, there's a number of other elements to the profession and to the job, such as working with technology, that aren't really accounted for. And so as we start to think about language access, um, is it sufficient to say, well, I have a certified interpreter here? Um, I think that that's a, a good starting point, um, but finding ways to be able to make, um, make sure that the services are being provided in a way that is going to um, enable um, access becomes increasingly important. So as I mentioned, there is some related to written translation in these language access plans. Um, and they're leveraging technology in a different way. Um, they're looking at um, creating multilingual web content in some respects, um, or providing translation of forms and, and creating form libraries um, and using technology to make that widely available um, as another point of contact with the, with the legal system. So when we start thinking about language access, um, I think there's a lot of different aspects we need to take into account. Um, you know, not only are we thinking about um, the presence of an interpreter or the presence of language services, but recognizing the power differentials that are in play, who, you know, there, there are significant power differences between the person who is trying to access the legal system and the um, system as, a, as an overarching entity. Um, and so, keeping that differential in mind becomes important. Um, the idea of agency and positioning, who are, who are the people involved? How are they making decisions? How are they positioned both um, virtually, um, spatially, um, relationally, um, all of these different types of considerations. Looking at the different settings as well, I mentioned criminal, non-criminal um, settings, asylum, immigration. Conflicts of interest, I think, become important. Um, in many, many contexts. Uh, and then ethics, uh, again, uh, kind of is this overarching um, presence that needs to be taken into account, um, along with technology, looking at these different modes, uh, types of technology that we can see, and, and what, the, what they bring to the table. Um, I have this slide in here for slight translation, because I think you know, and so we're all on the same page. Site translation is the oral rendition of a written text in a foreign language. Um, and we have guidance from research. We have guidance from, uh, Najit has position papers on, on site translation, talking about, um, you know, it's not a replacement for written translation, 
um, and some of the challenges that come into play. But this is a mode where, you know, provide if if there's a document that's been provided in a multilingual space, you know, using technology to try to push that out, does that um, absolve the the interpreter of of having to do this kind of work? Um, is site translation something that is doable in virtual spaces? Is site translation something that we need to be rethinking as um, a task that is being used within language access plans? Um, I think the certification justification is that interpreters are asked to do this on a regular basis. And so um, uh, preparing people and making sure that they can do it is important. But I think if if the last six to 12 months have been any indicator, the ability to do a lot of different things has been, has been really challenged and pushed in, in court interpreting. And so finding concrete examples like this to, to question and, and revisit become increasingly important. So that's language access, but really we've been, um, kind of driving questions about what well, technology and its intersection with this. So what is it? Um, to me, technology is a tool that enables or supports an interpreter. So it might enable certain types of interpreting, remote interpreting, um, telephonic interpreting, uh, video interpreting. Um, it can be something like a pad and, pe uh, pad and pencil, it could be a tablet and using a digital pen, um, smart pens uh, using either paper or a tablet. But all of these technologies can be used to support an interpreter in his or her work um, or enable them to work in a different context or space. But it's really important, I think, if, for us to think about technology and, and the fact that it's built on assumptions. Technology is not unbiased. Technology um, is built on assumptions about how work is done it's built on ideas about how work should be completed and the order in which it should be completed. And I'll give you um, two examples. First, let's think about um, uh, technology, uh, the technology we're using now, Zoom. Um, we all have been on Zoom calls. We all know that when somebody's speaking, your little box lights up around you. Um, and we, so that way we know that um, somebody's cell phone is ringing, or that someone's dog is barking, or that their doorbell, somebody's at the door. So we know that, right? But how does that, that's built on the assumption that sound should be what is activating a speaker. And if we think about sign language interpreting, um, if there's no oral output um, happening from a sign language interpreter, they may fall off the screen. And so our deaf and hard of hearing colleagues may not be able to pin the, the interpreter onto the screen so that they are actually able to um, have access to the meeting. Uh, I'll give you another uh, example of, a, of an assumption. If we are thinking about um, interpreting, either interpreting platforms or even we can continue thinking about some of these web conferencing tools. Say we manage to solve the, the issue of of making sure the interpreter is either always visible or maybe the interpreter doesn't need to be visible at all, but we have um, the audio channel. Um, does the platform allow for multiple interpreters to be working at the same time? And I think as working interpreters, many people know, well, they wanna be able to work in a team. They wanna be able to work um, with a colleague. And yet sometimes the technology is simply built on the assumption that one interpreter is simply enough. And so these technologies are not, they're instantiations of, an, of a set of assumptions that people have about the way that, techno, that interpreting should work. And so that becomes a really crucial element to consider when we are evaluating technologies to use in interpreting spaces. Uh, if we if we think about um, what those technologies are, we can classify them broadly about in terms of interpreting technologies that happen before interpreting, during interpreting, or, or after the fact. Um, but they, they don't necessarily have to live in these, in these silos. 
So terminology and glossary management tools to help prepare for an assignment can be used during the actual interpreting event and then can be revisited for update at the end. Um, and the same thing with interpreting management tools, being able to manage workflow and, and, and ideas, um, making sure that we have uh, interpreters scheduled and things like that. So those tools can, can be used in a number of places, but I think that they make sense conceptually um, in, these, in these other spaces. And then we have the, the tools that we use um, during interpreting itself. So video remote interpreting, telephone, the bidual, thinking about the headsets and transmitters, and increasingly the, the idea of the bring your own device, um, bringing your own device to the, to the courthouse or to an event to be able to listen in on a specific channel for the interpreting event. This is challenging and pushing our understanding of the way that, that interpreting has worked previously in the court system. Um, I have interpreted for many a judge that did not want to have cell phones in the room um, and did not want those out and did not want those used. And so the idea to have somebody bring their own device to and interact with that device explicitly during the um, a hearing is a, it represents a radical shift. Um, and so those technologies can really um, have us rethink the way that we are, are going about doing our work. When we're, re when we're evaluating these tools and thinking about, are they going to help us with access? Um, some tools are designed specifically for interpreters and they have the requisite functionality and they focus right on the tools that we want, which is great. Um, and I think interpreters really like working with those. Um, but at the same time, it does lock the interpreter into a specific workflow or task. Um, and, and it requires um, adopting uh, the practices as designed and prescribed by, the, by whoever made the tool. In contrast, we might have tools that are out there that are being repurposed. Um, so we're tweaking and using systems that weren't initially designed with interpreters in mind. Um, so you might have a lot of unused features um, like annotation on Zoom, since um, we keep getting a couple of notations on the screen. Um, or retrofit, and so we're stuck retrofitting, trying to fix or, or find ways to be able to um, make it uh, work the way we want it to work. And so we get this idea of the square peg in a round hole. Um, and so when we're trying to evaluate which tools we want to use, um, we also have to understand the constraints in which we're working. So for instance, um, one of the court management systems that records, that provides audio recordings um, of hearings uh, may be able to work in a virtual space, but it can't actually capture the interpreter working and the interpreter's audio channel. And so that may be a, a, a challenge that that particular um, system may have, and so would require thinking about how might we mitigate for that, for that potential challenge. So where do we get this stuff? Well, you can build your own, you can buy it, right? Um, but no matter what, you get what you pay for, either if you build it or you buy it. Um, if you build your own, um, it's, it could be customized for your specific context. It's, there's no frills. Um, you get what you need and no more, but it could be costly because you're starting from scratch and it could be buggy and you are going to be bumping into your, your own um, uh, mistakes. Um, and it requires that technical expertise and collaboration to be able to do that. And I think a lot of people aren't really in, they're in the business of interpreting, they're not in um, the business of creating technologies. So adopting those predetermined approaches to interpreting is, is often the way that people go, but you may get more, of, more than what you need um, and having the ability to scale can kind of be a challenge. Um, and I think one of the, th the I think one of the best ways to think about this is what is it if you ask an interpreter what they need, um, just think for think to yourself, what is it that I need from a technological standpoint to be able to do my job effectively as an interpreter. Um, and I think we probably could come up with a list of three, four, five different things right away of the things that we would need in order to be successful. But there's a challenge because if you sit down to create an interpreting tool, you have to 
articulate that. You have to make explicit all of those assumptions and all of those ideas that you have about interpreting, you have to get out onto a piece of paper. And so I'm sure that some of you might have seen this graphic before. Um, I find it rather amusing. Um, but if you think about how, um, uh, if you have to do that, what the client described is they wanted, you know, it looks like a swing and maybe had a pillow and, and it was free. You know, they wanted something that looked nice. Um, the architect that, you know, that you're talking to told you it was going to be a lazy boy that was going to have the sun shining and probably some birds chirping. And maybe somebody would bring you a nice glass of water or lemonade as you were sitting in your chair. But then as it started to be built, um, it was non-functional because you're, there you have your swing on the floor. The budget could only afford the one of the ropes. Um, and so this, this graphic, I think, illustrates one of the challenges um, with technology and developing technology, specifically for interpreters, because, or for anybody for that matter, because you have to be able to understand what it is and all of this, the assumptions that are in play um, about not only the task at hand, but it, what it is that you're trying to, to accomplish. So I think I find this to be a particularly illustrative um, approach to thinking about some of these technologies um, because all of the different stakeholders are going to have a somewhat different approach to dealing with it. Um, so what does this mean? It means that one size does not fit all. And so we need to be thinking about transla uh, translation and interpreting technologies when we're thinking about language access um, yeah, as something that is context dependent, specific to the to the environment in which it's being used, and to the parties that are involved. So what do these configurations look like? So we can be thinking about interpreters and the court system um, in a number of different configurations. We can think of a court setting where everybody is present except for the interpreter. We could think of um, a, a situation where everybody is present except for the non-English speaker. We could think of it from the perspective of multiple parties being virtual or everybody virtual. And so do the technologies that are, that are out there right now enable any or all of these configurations? So who is, who is being positioned where, how many people, what kind of setting, what are the needs? Um, when, when COVID started um, and everybody kind of went virtual, I think everybody started to try to figure out, well, how do we go about doing what we were used to doing in person and how do we do it in a virtual space? How do we adapt our workflow in order to account for that? And then, you know, over time, as, as things became a little bit more, um, you know, people started to get a better understanding of it their new configuration showed up. Well, if somebody goes into and works in the courthouse or two or three people are working in the courthouse but far away from each other and everybody else is zooming in or using whatever video conference technology that they um, had at their disposal, how, how can we make that, um, how can we make that work? Um, and then throw your interpreter into the mix as well and it becomes, challenging. Um, and so we run into a number of different issues. Technologies have not solved all of these, um, but there's there's some new research out on audio uh, acoustic shock, you know, because we're often using headsets to listen um, to virtual proceedings. And, and so can that have a, 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 a negative impact? Um, how can we deal with um, video conferencing fatigue? Um, what do we do about infrastructure because not everybody has a high speed broadband internet connection, um, especially if we're working in certain areas where there might not be the, the material infrastructure that's available to um, take into account some of these different technological needs. So these configurations, they continue to morph, they continue to grow. Um, and so we are, we're seeing a lot of different um, ways of conceptualizing the space and how can technology help mitigate for some of those. Making that determination needs to be beyond, and this is um, 
this is sort of the researcher in me that the it needs to be more than simply I like I don't like um, it needs to be we need to be adopting approaches to systematically evaluate some of these tools and we can do that in an experimental format. Um, this traditional idea of randomization and experimental control to look at specific variables does this impact X or Y can we establish a causal relationship between certain variables in technology. Um, we can do that in a quasi experimental setting where we can't um, we can't maybe achieve full randomization we can't necessarily have groups that we're um, controlling in every in every different manner. Um, but to be able to achieve um, some sort of ecological validity so we can understand are is this working in the space in which we're trying it to have it work as well as some of the observational research, just not manipulating the variables, but trying to describe that process. What does it look like? What are people's opinions of it? And, and getting a broad range that's of, of opinions and viewpoints that's more systematic as opposed to, well, in my context, this is what happens. Um, I think that those initial questions and comments about this works for me or this doesn't work for me are a great starting point for, for some of these questions, but then finding ways to really probe beyond that initial um, instinct um, becomes increasingly important. So it's challenging to do this kind of work. Um, and I think that it's something that we need to be doing more of, um, and particularly in the US legal context. Um, but it's hard because we have different language experiences. We have certified people. We have non-certified people. We have um, the interpreters with all different kinds of, of, of different individual traits and variables. So we need to keep that in mind. Um, we also have to remember that their relationship with technology might be different. Like we may have some of those early adopters. We all know that person that goes out and buys the next iPhone. Um, and we know that person who is still using, remember those Nokia phones that you could like, they're like bricks, they're like doorstops. Um, we know those people. And so we, that, that is gonna have an impact on, on how they react to using specific technologies. The same thing with um, the experience with technology in other domains, they may be able to transfer some of those skills because they're working with similar technologies. Um, it may be a, a much easier step to bring one new thing in. Um, so these are different ways that we can, these are challenges, but I think they're also opportunities as we continue to reflect on technology use. Um, and also taking into account, you know, those indiv individual behaviors and traits. At the moment, we don't have a lot of good scales that are developed specifically to probe some of these questions. And so that becomes a new um, area that we need to be spending some time thinking. Uh, so what does that mean? Where are we now? Well, I think um, I think it's fairly safe to say that there's a lot more remote going on now than there was six months ago. Um, that doesn't mean it's going to be like that forever. Um, but the systems, at least at the time, weren't totally ready for that for that kind of switch. The certain courts had to try to work real hard at, at figuring that out. Um, there were a number of initiatives by a number of different interpreters over time. Who, uh, and court systems that were trying to, to test this out and figure out how to make things work. Um, but new questions have come up. How do we handle issues of security, privacy, confidentiality? How do we avoid Zoom bombing? Um, even people that are working in, in high level positions have had faux pas with, with Zoom and, and video conferencing recently. And so how can we mitigate for that and how do we address it so that we don't have these sorts of issues? And do we have the infrastructure in place in order to be able to have people um, doing um, using these technologies effectively? Um, there may be disparities in place that are economic disparities, technological disparities that ultimately need to be addressed in order for there to be linguistic and language access to the legal system if we want to put everybody on equal footing in this digital and virtual space. What's next? Your guess is as good as mine. Um, but there are a few um, technologies that I, I see more and more um, popping up. The first being artificial intelligence and natural language processing. 
being able to process audio channels that are coming in um, in real time and being able to either transcribe or record uh, either pieces of information or the whole um, source language utterance. Um, there's a lot of documented research on the difficulties with interpreting numbers, for instance, in simultaneous. And so can these technologies help take some of the burden off of the interpreter by catching that key information and, and making it readily available? Heads up displays, finding ways to get um, terminology right in your face, right when you need it. Um, this um, just-in-time technology is, is really starting to um, take shape in some exciting and uh, sometimes surprising ways. And machine interpreting. Um, I think a lot of people are worried, or at least there's a lot of um, discussion around whether there's going to be um, a, some sort of technology that's going to replace interpreters. Um, my instinct is no, uh, and I think that there's a place for some of these things. Um, there were uh, some initiatives by the Department of Defense at one time that were trying to use um, machine interpreting and um, volatile high-risk environments. Um, there's, there was a Verbo Mobile in 2000, well, 80s, 90s, and um, a volume came out in 2000 that kind of uh, described all the research that had been done there. Um, and so these are all technologies that our people are working on, in addition to enhancing the video and remote interpreting services that are out there, um, that are addressing any number of different um, of the currently in place technologies. Tablet interpreting is something that people are really starting to pay more attention to. Um, whether or not they're going to be um, immediately adopted and implemented, I think um, that's probably not the case, um, but it's going to be something that um, I think both interpreters and court administrators and language access coordinators are really going to be spending some time looking at to determine how these tools may be able to help provide more linguistic access to their um, court systems. So I think we're about at time. I'm going to click slowly through the next two slides simply so that if you're watching this in a, in a replay, you can see some of the references that I have. Um, there are plenty of other ones out there. This is an in, incomplete list, um, but these references are available. I did want to point out one at the very end of this slide. Um, there was a project that was put together by SSTI, which is the nonprofit arm of uh, the National Association of Judiciary Interpreters and Translators that put together a bibliography of research on um, legal translation and interpreting. Um, and it's a bibliography that um, is quite extensive um, and it's available on the website that's listed there. So if you want to go look at a list of references that's much bigger than the list that I've put here, um, I would definitely go check that out. So with that, I'm going to say thank you so much for spending some time here with me. And um, I would be happy to entertain any questions that anybody may have. Um, and thank you again.